Hey, howdy, hey, my Bruin brothers and sisters. Howdy, hey, howdy. Ah, <laughs> uh, John, you troublemaker. You just, yeah, trying, just... To, just trying, to, trying to throw me off, aren't you? <laughs> just got to uh, change maybe... it up once, once in a while, you know. Love variety. Can't sure. do it the same way all the time. Sure. I guess I guess that's the uh, that's the way it is for you. Um, <clears throat> I've been uh, just like a one legged one legged man in the uh, ass kicking contest. It's been uh, it's been crazy. Lots of that's lots crazy. of work up there in in the Bay Area. Huh? Yeah, it's you know all the pandemic changes. Everything's everything's changing every day. Everything's changing now. We can't get cans. We can't get CO two. We can't you know. Right. There's too many, too many problems. Too many problems indeed. Yeah, I can see that. <sighs> but you know, here I get a chance to uh, sit with you for an hour or two, and uh, you know, you make have you, a beer. Seeing you makes me happy. Oh, you good, know? good. Even pandemic distance uh, still makes me happy. <laughs> and you know who else makes me happy? Our good friend John Blickman, I would imagine. There you go. He, you know, and not just because he pays for this show, so uh, all you listening uh, don't have to. It's because he's actually a, a, a genius uh, engineering mind that has dedicated uh, his life to uh, making your brew day uh, you know, that much more, uh, innovative and right. easy and fun. And, uh, uh, so, uh, check them out. Blickmanengineering.com. Uh, if you get a chance, uh, look at all the neat stuff they have there and send an email to my good friend, John Blickman at uh, feedback at Blickmanengineering.com. Tell John how much you appreciate that he's paid for the show. So you don't have to. So that's, right. that's the least you could do. You could do for me today. Uh, our guest today is uh, Martin Cornell. He is an eight-time winner of the British Guild of Beer Writers Award and one of the UK's most read beer bloggers. He has written about beer, food, travel, and the history of beer for newspapers and mag magazines around the world. His book, Amber, Gold, and Black, is regarded as the definitive history of British beer styles. And uh, Martin's currently... Uh, finishing up a three-year project on kind of the history and uh you know the the fascinating stories of porter uh, as a beer style in, across the world and so we thought it'd be kind of a fun thing to to get them uh, here and uh, speak with us about porter how are you doing martin oh i'm doing well thank you yes it's uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here I, it didn't, wasn't meant to be a three-year project uh but it just <laughs> grew and grew you know there it turns out that there is just so much to say about porter as the the world's first global beer style the, the first style to not only be drunk uh in dozens of countries around the world but, but brewed in in dozens of countries around the world as well and i think people have perhaps forgotten uh or never never knew just how popular porter used to be mm -hmm. Oh, we, we, yeah. we never planned on this being a 16 year show, did we? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, so there, there you go. Uh, time sneaks up on you. Well, and Porter was, you know, one of the, f the first, uh, industrial beer. Uh, is, is that correct? You know, yeah. um, uh, mass produced it, beer. It, it, it turned out, uh, once they, uh, started making the beer, um, that it was actually very suitable for uh, producing on a much larger scale than they've been able to do before. It was a very uh, robust beer. Uh, and as I'm, I'm sure you know, and I'm sure a lot of the uh, people well, watching and listening know, um, for a long time before the invention of uh, cool, cooling technologies, it was impossible to brew successfully uh, from about the end of April right through till really uh, September or even the end of September. Um, so they had to brew strong beers in March, strong beers in October uh, to, to last that, that gap. Porter they found because uh, probably of the, of the uh, brown malts that went into it because of the greater quantities of hops that went into it, you were able to brew it uh, for a, a longer time period. You could, you could go right through till uh, May, you could begin again 
uh, at the beginning of September, this was an advantage immediately for the for the porter brewers. I and see. also, um, you could brew it in larger vessels. And this was also important for, for scaling up because, uh, again, before uh, cooling technology, the larger the vessel, the hotter the, f the fermentation got and the more you were likely to have a, a set. Uh -huh. With Porter, again, because it was a much more robust beer, um, you could use larger vessels and uh, you've got all the economies of scale and so on. So uh, the Porter brewers found that they were able to uh, to grow larger than the, than the the ale and the ordinary uh, beer brewers before them were, were able to do, uh, and these economies of scale eventually meant that that they uh, the, the the porter brewers just uh, outpaced everybody else. Hmm. When uh, um, the whole story of how uh, porter started now there was always the story of uh, ralph harwood in 1722 oh. making a beer called entire it was the three threads and this was the start of porter and uh, how, how true was any of that uh, <laughs> ralph harwood yes um but when i when i first started researching this stuff i'd read all the books and they all said ralph harwood blah, blah, as you say 1722 and i thought right okay well let's let's try to find um actual evidence for this this happening when when did it happen let's find out more about it but the more i researched it uh the more i was unable to find anything uh, from the time period from the early 18th century uh that confirmed that this story was true and it, it turns out that uh what what happened what seems to have happened it was that in uh in 1802 I, in other words 80 years after the event supposedly being described a journalist uh, called uh, John Felton wrote a story in which he uh, got a bit confused uh, about references to three threads, which which was a thing. Three threads was a thing at the beginning of the 18th century. Mm -hmm. He got confused with uh, one or two mentions about Ralph Harwood, who was a brewer in Shoreditch on the edge of London, uh, but not a very big brewer. He was about the 20th largest brewer in London at that time, when London had probably 80 or 100 uh, big, big and small brewers. So Ralph Harwood was, uh, certainly he brewed porter, but he wasn't, he wasn't one of the major players at all. Um, Felton managed to get hold of a few bits of information and basically invent the story that uh, porter which is also known as entire butt, and we'll, we'll come back to the to the reasons for that later on, I'm sure. Uh, Porter, he decided, was a replacement for this beer that had existed called Three Threads. Uh, wrote this story, as is the way with uh, 18th century journalism, this was immediately plagiarised and repeated by literally dozens of other publications uh, across Britain and eventually around the world repeated hundreds and hundreds of times and because nobody ever challenged it nobody ever uh, attempted to find out if there was any actual basis for this story it it became the accepted um, story behind the uh, invention of Porter and I, I think one of the reasons was that people like the idea of, of the hero who comes up with uh, the answer to a problem, you know, that yeah. supposedly um, this, the story that Felton put up was that three threads uh, required serving from three different casks. And this, this man called uh, Ralph Howard solved the problem of the poor old landlord having to rush back with some fours uh, from tap to tap uh, by combining it all in, in one cask. Uh, and this was the, the entire, but uh, unfortunately that's all complete nonsense <laughs> what uh, what three threads actually was was it was a tax fiddle um back in the early 19th century of course they had no way of measuring the strength of of beer to tax it so they did it on the price of the beer uh beer under a certain price was taxed as small beer and I, it paid i can't remember exactly how much but something like let's say uh, six pence to a barrel a cask uh strong beer which uh, which they defined as having a retail value of, I think, over six shillings a, a barrel. Um, that paid 
one and sixpence tax, one shilling and sixpence. Um, but because they didn't know how to uh, measure or couldn't successfully measure um, what strong or what weak was, there was the possibility of brewing extra strong beer, and that would only pay the tax on strong beer. Uh -huh. What landlords and brewers started doing was brewing extra strong beer, which only paid the tax, the same tax as strong beer, and then mixing that with the small beer, which had paid less tax. They now had two barrels of beer, the same strength as strong, extra strong, yeah. and, and the small mixed together. You got two uh, two barrels of strong, which had only paid the, the total yeah. tax of one strong and one weak. I hope you I hope you're following me, and I'm not. Yeah, really yeah, confused. yeah. So, beating uh, on yeah. the tax, they were getting more profit. Uh, it was all illegal, of course. You know, the law the law uh, stopped this happening, or supposed to stop this happening. But that was what three threads was. Uh, it was a mixture of very strong beer and weak beer sold as strong beer uh, in order to try to not pay as much tax as they were meant to. Had nothing at all to do with Porter. Uh, Porter has a completely different set of origins. Um, Porter began as uh, London Brown beer, which was one of the, the big sellers at, at the time. Uh, and what year was that? And that was we're talking, London Brown beer was um, through from the probably the arrival of, of hopped beer in this country, uh, which is you know the 15th century when uh, Im immigrants from um, Europe bought the use of hops. Previously, we'd had <laughs> ale, which which originally meant unhopped uh, beer, maybe flavoured with other things, maybe not. You know, it's, sure. it's actually quite unclear. But we will uh, we'll try. <laughs> I'll try not to lose the plot by talking about that. So hot beer came in. Uh, it was uh, brown. It was fairly lightly hopped. It was probably quite strong, um, seven percent, perhaps something on that sort of order. Uh, and this ran through quite happily until the end of the uh, 18th, 17th century, when uh, the government was looking for ways to raise revenue. We were involved with a lot of wars in Britain at that time, um, fighting the French, uh, fighting in Ireland, fighting in North America, a war I believe you guys called King William's War. Um, and the government needed to raise money to, to pay for this. So they, they started putting uh, taxes up on uh beer itself and also on malt and on hops so what the brewers did to try to keep their beer affordable uh, they did what brewers always do they lowered the strength uh two problems with that one problem is that if you uh lower the strength then the beer is likely to go off more quickly so they therefore increased the amount of hops in in the beer oh, yeah. the other thing that they did was to start using uh, cheaper malt and the cheapest malt was wood dried malt. Problem with wood dried malt is that it's very smoky. It's rauch, rauch beer basically. Right. Uh, so to try to get rid of the smoky flavours they stored the beer longer because over uh, six months nine months the, the smoky the very strong smoke taste will, will slowly disappear. Um, and they were able to do this uh, because they were hopping it more anyway, so they just up the hops, and that way the beer would would keep even longer until the smoky flavours had, had reduced, certainly if not totally vanished. What they didn't they didn't they didn't know what was going to happen next. But what happened next over the period that they were storing it, of course, and again they they knew nothing about this. Bretonomyces, which was ubiquitous in wooden brewing vessels and, right. and uh, storage vessels and so on. Britain and Mises comes out of the wood and starts munching away uh, at all the higher sugars and so on in the beer, producing all these lovely estuary flavours. At the same time, because you've now got a very well hot brew, you're not getting the sorts of uh, lactobacillus and pediococcus organisms that you, you do in, for example, um, lamp, uh, those sorts of Belgian sour beers right. so you were ending up at the uh, after the um storage period when the beer went on sale you now had a beer that was 
beautifully smooth, um, lots of lovely estuary flavors to it, uh, all entirely unplanned, but uh, proved an enormous hit. Right. And it was an enormous hit with the uh, working men of London, basically. And these guys, uh, many of them worked uh, carrying goods on and off ships, uh, carrying goods around the streets, uh, taking parcels hither and there, uh, carrying packages. And these people were known as porters. And uh, they were they were organised uh, by the City of London authorities into two separate types. There were the fellowship porters who did the uh, carrying on and off board ships and the street porters or ticket porters. They uh, needed an awful lot of calories to keep them going. It was hard work, strenuous work. They uh, needed uh, to, uh, lots of energy uh, to carry on doing this. And one of the ways that they got their energy was by drinking, drinking on the job. Well, so that's, they, that's why they, I drink on the job. Well, absolutely. <laughs> so they drank a lot of beer while they were working. They were notorious for it. Uh, and it was uh, six, seven, eight pints a day these guys were drinking. Wow. Not to get themselves drunk, but to just get the calories to be able to do their their tough, hard jobs. Um, so it started out uh, that they were, they, they gradually uh, were storing this beer longer and longer uh, in butts, which is uh, the size of cask, um, three times a barrel, if I'm remembering correctly, which is 108 gallons. Uh, Storing these for uh, nine months and up to a year, gradually they, they learned that if they stored it uh, longer and longer, the beer got, got better and better. Um, so this was originally known as uh, butt beer because it was stored in butts. Uh, and, but gradually uh, it, it got the, the name of the people that were, that were his biggest fans, Porters. So it, it, the name slowly changed from being referred to as butt beer to being referred to as porter. <laughs> so <laughs> I hope that, that has given yeah. you a sufficient explanation. There right. the let's, take a, let's take a short break. Yes. And when we come back, I want to hear more about uh, how porter developed. We'll be back right after this. All right, we're back. We're talking with Martin Cornell about uh, the history of porter. And he's been uh, researching uh, uh, Porter for the last uh, three years, and probably you know before that too. You you learned a lot about Porter, and you were talking about how they were they were storing the beer in butts uh, for nine months, a year, and and the beer improved because of the Britannomyces. Yeah. But uh, you know, I've also heard these stories of the the large. Uh, uh, you know, uh, large vats um, in in yeah. London, and then the, the the staves giving way and drowning yeah. people in the streets. And what what about those stories? Well, the uh, the problem with um, storing it in butts is that you needed a lot of cellars to to store this beer in, uh, and it was also expensive in in terms of you know, um, cooperage. Yeah, having the, yeah having the butts. Uh, built by the Coopers in the first place and maintaining them. And they, they had constant problems that people were stealing, stealing the butts, you know, cutting them in half and using them as flower planters and all, all sorts of other things. Uh, and it was actually quite dangerous. There are stories of um, people going down into, into the cellars where these butts were sitting. And of course there's a fermentation going on. And again, they didn't know what was happening. But these butts, of course, were f uh, these cellars were filling up with CO2, carbon dioxide, you know, people were going in there and collapsing other people were going in there to try to rescue them, collapsing as well. You know, people were dying in these in these cellars sometimes. Mm. Um, so nobody's exactly sh sure when it started happening, but people uh, worked out that maybe it was better rather than uh, having all these butts lying around in these cellars. And I think they were paying a shilling a butt a year uh, to, to lease out cellars around the city of London. Uh, maybe it was better to, to start building large vats so they started off building uh, fats that were 150 barrel size. And gradually as the, the fat builders te uh, technology got better, so the vats got larger and larger. Uh, but they did uh, have a series of unfortunate accidents. Um, the, the famous one, of course, was uh, the great flood of beer flood of London in 1814. But there have been quite a few over the years before that. Uh, uh, there was one uh, in 
Whitbread's Brewery on the edge of the city of London, where uh, apparently they, they drowned uh, hundreds of rats when the, when the vat burst and flooded into into the cellars and uh, pulling out dead rats for an extended period afterwards. So they were they were pushing the envelope as far as the technology was concerned, um, and it, it eventually ended in in dramatic fashion, of course, with the the great London beer flood and that wasn't even one of the biggest vats that was a 3,000 barrel vat I think uh, at that particular brewery uh, called Mewksies M-E-U-X Mewks Mr Mewks um, it was one of the smaller vats in the in the brewery they had 20,000 barrel vats but that oh. that kind of uh, put an end to the fashion of building bigger and bigger vats I mean it was a bit if I may <laughs> use the expression it was a bit willy waving really you know my bat vat is bigger than your vat right so, right oh, fantastic um and, and also you know one of the fascinating things about porter is is the way that uh tastes changed uh the the taste the public's taste for a long time was for well-aged porter uh, gradually, in fact, by the time uh, the, the Great London Beer Flood, tastes were moving away to uh, what was known as mild porter, which was which was mild meaning young, unaged. The uh, the aged porter was called stale in in the terminology of the time, which is not okay. stale as we use the word today. It just meant it stood; it had been standing around, and it had got all those lovely uh, kind of uh, estuary slightly tart uh flavors from the Britannomyces. Mild, yeah indeed and the mild uh porter was a lot sweeter not not a lot sweeter but certainly sweeter uh gradually over the uh as the 18th century wore on whereas previously around about the 1740s they would they would tended to be drinking uh all stale porter um you know aged anything up to a couple of years they started uh, mixing the mild, the young porter, fresh porter, with the the older porter. Okay. Um, and so by the by the time you get into the nineteenth century, uh, you would be you would still be able to go into a into a public house and you would order porter, and they would be able to pour it from two different pumps, one stale, one mild, and you would say, you know, draw it mild or draw it stale or whatever was your your preference. Uh, so, um, and again, by that time, um, because slowly people were, were turning away from the, the very strong, very tart flavours, and um, why there's a, you know, a subject that one could spend hours debating uh, why tastes in beer changed, but I, I don't think we'll ever know why. Um, and eventually, by the end of the 19th century, you start uh, reading about them the pulling down these, these huge vats. Uh, out of the breweries and, and recycling them into um, bars in pubs. So somewhere, perhaps even even now, there are bars in pubs that are built out of out of recycled old porter vats. I, I don't know. I've always wanted to see if it's possible to start drilling into a few old pub bars. Yeah. See if we can identify them. <laughs> Dendrochronology, as it, I believe is the, the expression. Well. And one one thing I, I love about uh, your writing and uh, the, the work you do, you really dig into what was the truth. You know, a lot of these stories that we get are just just that stories, and that's and the truth is somewhere, you know, in between all the stories. And you 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 dig in and you actually research and have proof as to why something actually happened, you know, the way that you write about it, which I really love. And uh, I got to also give you uh, uh, kudos for your uh, Strange Tales of Ale, which is oh, one of my favorite books. I love that book. I think everyone uh, that's interested in beer and they, you know, just kind of the s stories and, and history of beer ought to get, get themselves a copy. I think you pick it up off of Amazon uh, mm -hmm. uh, pretty Pretty cheap in the U.S. So, uh, uh, well, I mean, I, um, uh, my career has been as a journalist, uh, and I I like the stories. You know, I like telling telling the stories, um, and there are some fantastic stories around, and, and uh, there are uh, stories that that turn out to be true that everybody didn't think was true. One of the 
ones in, in Strange Tales Vale, we're getting completely off the subject of uh, Porter for a moment, uh, is about the um, IPA shipwreck. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the story was that uh, IPA was introduced uh, into Britain. It had only been a, a beer sold, sold in India, but it was introduced in Britain after a ship was wrecked in a storm. And uh, the um, insurance companies salvaged some of the beer and put it on sale uh, in Liverpool and everybody said well this is great we want more of this and, and that started a market for IPA in England as opposed to in India and nobody had been able to find uh, the story of this wreck and everybody said oh this is just a myth it, it didn't happen. Now the great thing about being a researcher today with the internet uh, is the number of newspapers that are now out there, the old newspapers that have been scanned. It is unbelievable. In fact, there's far too much information out there. Uh, but it does mean that you can you can actually track these stories down. And I was uh, looking for something else um, and found this magazine where uh, this guy actually talks about this incident. Now, it, the book that it uh, is reported in said, that it happened in 1827, if I remember correctly. So everybody had been looking around that kind of period for this, this supposed shipwreck and been unable to find it. This obscure magazine article, which somebody had scanned in and put on the web, uh, said that it had happened in 1839 and, and gave the name of the ship, the Crusader. Uh, and so given those two clues and given the fact that there are now uh, thousands and thousands of newspapers scanned it took about half an hour to find newspaper reports of yes this this shipwreck this ship genuinely had gone down in a, a famous storm in 1839 um one of the most violent storms ever to hit the british isles uh it had been wrecked off the coast of uh, blackpool which is in uh, just north of, of liverpool um the, the crew had all escaped but the Barrels, uh, and even named the brewers, Bass and Allsop, two very famous uh, Burton-on-Trent IPA brewers. Uh, the barrels had washed up and down the coast. Indeed, they had been salvaged, and the newspapers actually carried uh, the reports of the sale of these, of these barrels of IPA. So, yes, this story that everybody thought was a myth <laughs> was actually true. And, and, and we could now, uh, thanks to the internet and thanks to uh, all the hard work that uh, libraries and other people have, have put into uh, scanning all these newspapers, we, we can now actually point to this. Uh, and the same is the same is true with uh, a lot of, of the uh, stuff in the in the Porter book that I simply would not have all these great stories that I'm finding um, without the fact that you can now find all these newspapers uh, on the web. So you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the London Brown beer and uh, up until a certain date, Porter was, uh, you know, a paler version than we see today, today with black patent malt, yeah. the, the, the invent of the, the patent malt, it, it became darker. Yeah. Or... Yeah. Well, one of, the, one of the problems that they, that they had, uh, technologically speaking was that, was that, a around about um, the 1780s, they started uh, using the saccharometer to measure uh, how much fermentable material they were getting out of their malt. And, it, and at that point, they realized that the brown malt that they were using, 100% brown malt, diastasic brown malt, so something that we, we really don't have today. Um, uh, and we're not even certain how to make, although people have, of course, started trying to, to make uh, diastasic brown malt. Diastasic brown malt is very bad value for money uh, because you, you don't get a lot of fermentable material out of it compared to pale malt. The um, porter brewers were always under enormous pressure to keep costs down and to, and to sell their beer as cheaply as possible. And every time uh, they tried to put the price of a, of a pint or a quart of porter up, there were literally riots on the street and, and mm. uh, you know, people... Oh. Uh, protesting outside brewers' homes and, and so on. So um, they realised that it would be a lot cheaper to brew 
the beer with pale malt because they would get much better extract out of it. But then, of course, they'd lose the colour. It wouldn't be the mm. dark colour that people wanted. I was probably... Uh, descriptions um, seem to hint that it wasn't the complete black beer that we know today. It was very, it was certainly very dark brown. Um, but they, they talk about it being made transparent. Well, that suggests, because to begin with, it wasn't transparent. And gradually, as they learned to age it more and to use Isinglass, it became transparent. Well, that, that is a hint that you could actually see through it. It wasn't totally, totally black. Um, <laughs> but even so, people, people expected their porter to be very dark. So okay. uh, if you brew a beer with, with uh, quantities of pale malt, obviously it's not going to be as dark. So th they needed to find ways of making a, a dark beer, uh, but by still using as much pale malt as they could get away with. The problem they had was that the tax authorities would not let them put anything into uh, beer that had not been taxed. So they couldn't use burnt sugar or anything like that. Uh, they had a great deal of difficulty persuading the tax authorities to actually let them use roast malt. They couldn't use roast barley because that hadn't been taxed. Eventually, uh, a man called Daniel Wheeler invented uh, a way of roasting malt upon which the tax had been paid so that was fine uh, and producing an extract that you then only had to use i think they started off using five percent you could actually get as low as two percent of this uh brown uh, roasted malt in a completely otherwise pale malt beer uh so unfortunately for him he then lost uh, the case when he tried to protect his, his patent and although people carried on calling it patent malt he didn't have a, a patent on it and so he didn't make the money obviously that he was expecting to um, so but from, from that point on from 1817 on you start to see uh, increasing use of uh, this roast malt uh, there was a split interestingly between uh, practice in Ireland where they, almost all Irish brewers, if not all Irish brewers, and certainly Guinness, went over to using uh, like 98% pale malt and just and 2% uh, okay. roast malt. In Britain, and certainly in London, the brewers liked to use at least a certain quantity, uh, 10, 15, maybe even 20% of, of brown or amber malt, because they, they felt it gave, gave a better flavour. So then that's where you start to see a difference between Irish style porters and stouts and, and British style porters and stouts. All right, let's uh, take uh, one more short break. And when we come back, I, I, I want to hear more about uh, Ireland and how, you know, is porter and stout the same thing or are, <laughs> they, are they really different? We'll be back right after this. All right, we're back. We're talking the history of porters and uh, in around the world uh we haven't gotten around the world yet but we've gotten now to ireland and uh you know one of the questions i always get from people is well, what's the difference between porter and stout and you know you make up some sort of uh you know uh, differentiation and, and generally i think uh you know porters tend to you know have a, a different character than a, a lot of the especially the dry stouts uh yeah. but you know, over at, at, back in time, it was Irish brewers were brewing porter, and then they just started saying, well, I have a stout porter. I have an yeah. extra porter, and then it became like an extra stout, and it was just kind of a marketing thing to say, to call your beer stout, because it sounds more impressive than porter. Uh, but yes. Yeah, originally, I mean, the only difference originally was that, that stout simply meant strong. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. It was a stronger version. And uh, originally, you didn't have to uh, even be brown or reporter or black. You would get pale stout, and pale stout was a thing. Uh, certainly, as late as the 1840s, you, you get mentions of pale stout. Uh, brewers in London were, were brewing pale stout. Uh, and the stronger versions of porter were brown stout, and that was, that was what they were called. Uh, uh, but if you read the descriptions of um, brewers talking about the beers, they use 
uh, strong porter and, and brown stout more or less interchangeably. You know, um, it, there was no real um, distinct difference uh, between, you know, where, where a porter turned into a stout, apart from around about, you know, maybe seven or eight percent, you start calling it a stout porter. Mm -hmm. uh, and gradually the porter bit got left off and so it was just stout but to begin with they were uh, exactly the same beer except that one was was stronger than the other uh, and they were normally uh, brewed from exactly the same uh, grain bill exactly the same uh, hot bill and, it, and you might even get um, you know off the same mash uh, sorry off the same quantity of grain you would your first mash would be the stout porter your next one would be your ordinary porter and then you you'd have probably um the last washings you would recycle back into the into the next mash which was not not an uncommon thing for for people to be doing then so it was stout and porter exactly the same beer uh gradually through the 19th century you start to see stouts being brewed on their own and there was a tendency for stouts uh, to become a little sweeter and you then uh, get this whole divergence into um, milk stouts and, and uh, other uh, sweeter forms of stout uh, but, but in Ireland certainly but they, they never really went uh, particularly for the uh, the sweet stars of stout uh, then you, you, you do have these these dry stouts um, but uh, Guinness internally uh, just called its beers Porter and Extra Porter for a long time. Um, and that, that, as far as they were concerned, they were, they were all porters. And it was only, indeed, for marketing purposes that they called it uh, Stout and Extra Stout and Foreign Extra Stout. And the only difference between the Extra Stout uh, and the foreign extra stout was that the foreign extra stout had more hops in because it was going abroad uh, to hotter climes and therefore it needed to to have more hops in to preserve it. Now, Martin, I have a question. Yes. At this point in time, was the beer still being aged for a long period or they had stopped that, say, in you know, a period before? Uh, by now, uh, by, the, by probably the age... 1950s you're, you're now getting um what what was called running porter uh which was okay. very, very fresh uh and very um you know sent out quite quickly uh and at the same time you were getting the the aged stouts okay so uh yes you start to you start to see um a split between the the the, the aged stuff and the, the fresher stuff, because uh, people were, were, as far as, you know, most people were concerned, they, they, they didn't want these very heavy, very uh, strong tasting beers anymore. Some people did. So there was a, a market for the aged uh, stouts. But people were much more into um, running porters, porters that were served up uh, very quickly. Okay. Um, yeah, because you know, my my impressions of the brown malt porters uh where I've, I've brewed with brown malt and it is a very dry astringent flavor yeah. very strong that would take time to to precipitate out and mellow uh, yeah. i know my own uh effort did and so when they started switching from the brown malt to the pale malt because of the invention of the saccharimeter um so I guess that was sort of this transition from the brown malts and the long aging to mellow the beer to the pale malts and the ability to serve younger beers. And then, as you say, with the invention of the uh, patent roast malt, that facilitated that transition as well. So I guess, yeah, yeah so the, this was the period of time where we're seeing both a, a um, procedural or an industrial transformation of the beer as well as a change in the style. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one of the fascinating things I think about porter um, is that if, if anybody says, I want to brew an authentic porter, you have to say, right, well, when do you want to be authentic to? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Of history, would you like to 
to be authentic to because it, it's changed. You know, we think of it as like you know, Porter is Porter. It's changed half a dozen at least different times down down the years. Fascinating. Well, and it yeah. seems to me like a lot of the the change to Porter was really just uh, financially driven. You know, yeah. Uh, to the change in the malts, the change in uh, aging. You know, aging a beer is expensive. You know, oh, yeah. it, it requires, you know, uh, storage and, you know, you've locked up your materials for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and you get uh, obvious losses when you, when you age a beer. So I think a, a lot of the, yeah. the history of Porter is just driven by, you know, economics. Yeah. Well, this was, of course, was one of the barriers to entry for, for smaller brewers, um, that they, they couldn't afford to tie up this capital in, uh, um aging the beer for, for a couple of years um, and it's it's why the London uh, porter brewers um, porter brewing became restricted to uh, six eight or so really really big companies uh, which came to to dominate the market um, and then a whole mass of other much smaller uh, brewers below them and it, it, uh, it wasn't until uh, brewing technology so there was still um, Although uh, I think at the at its height, Porter was about eighty percent of the of uh, the London beer market. Um, gradually, that started to fall away as as people's tastes changed, or uh, not so much people's tastes changing as as Porter drinkers dying and not being re replaced by a new cohort of Porter drinkers. The new drinkers that were coming in were, were drinking different sorts of beers, um, and they were drinking mild ale quite fresh, still quite strong. Um, and gradu gradually at the same time, what was happening was that uh, technology was catching up so that you could you could brew these mild ales on the same sorts of scale that the porter brewers had been able to, to okay. brew their beers. So uh, the London mild ale brewers had all been very much smaller than, than the porter brewers. The porter brewers uh, were getting up to 200,000 barrels a year each you know which which for the time was enormous these were the guys were the biggest brewers in in the world uh the ale brewers were a tenth of the size twenty thousand barrels or so on. suddenly in in the 19th century uh as taste change and ale becomes more popular and uh, uh and as technology enables the ale brewers to brew on the same sort of scale as the porter brewers had you see the the ale brewers uh suddenly it, gain on uh, in, in terms of size gaining rapidly on the porter brewers and by the by the 1860s or so uh names that have been you know well down the the rankings um when they were our brewers are now as big as the big london porter brewers um so uh, again it, it's, it's, it's this mystery why do why do people's tastes change we don't know but they they do mm -hmm. and one of the fascinating things about that is um Every single style of beer has always been replaced eventually by another style of beer. Uh, so you saw port. I'm talking about Britain specifically here, but it's true in other countries as well. Uh, you see porter replaced by mild beer. You saw mild beer in Britain replaced by bitter. And then you saw bitter replaced by lager. What's going to replace lager? People are starting to talk about uh, IPAs. And I would not be at all surprised if we see eventually the, the uh, 90 or 100 year rule of big lager finally succumb to a new type of beer because it's happened to every other oh, yeah. uh, dominant type of beer. You know, again, this is one of, the, one of the fascinating things about Porter is seeing it decline and then uh, surge back up again. Right. If Porter declined when it was such a massive, massive, huge um, mm -hmm. force in the in in the market, why should the same not happen to to longer? I don't know. Well, and did did Porter really decline, or did we just start calling it Stout more? Uh, well, you know? uh, that's an, uh, again an interesting um, question in in Britain and in Ireland. Um, one of the problems again was that uh, strengths started to fall partly initially in the 19th century to try to keep the beer 
cheap. Um, and then we hit, we in, in Britain, we had the First World War. World War One came along. Uh, taxes soared enormously. They went up from about um, less than a pound a barrel to uh, five pound to ten pound, fifteen pound a barrel. Mm. Um, this again put, uh, has previously put pressure on brewers to keep try to keep the beer affordable. So uh, uh, strengths plunged. Uh, and what had been, Porter had been before the First World War in Britain, been around about five and a half, six percent alcohol. End of the First World War, it was down to three, three and a half percent. Stout had gone down as well, but stout was now the same strength that Porter had been. So if you wanted that same experience, you now drank stout rather than Porter. And Porter uh, was very much an old man's drink. Um, it was you know, literally dying on his feet. And it finally, I think the last porter in Britain, there's still kept on in Ireland, where it was drunk by shipyard workers who just came off the came off shift and wanted something to wash the dust from their throats and to refresh them and stuff. In, uh, in Britain, the last porter was brewed in uh, the early years of the Second World War and then just vanished after after 250 years. So, so yes, it's true uh, that... Porter was was replaced by Stout, uh, but uh, as, as far as being Britain's favourite beer was concerned, it, it was replaced by Mild Ale. Mild mm -hmm. Ale was the dominant working class beer in Britain. In America, interestingly, there was not this replacement of Porter by Stout. Um, there seems to be very few, from what I've been able to find, very few beers called Stout brewed in oh. in the states it was almost almost called porter um it was uh, very regionally popular in uh, certainly uh entering around pennsylvania and in new york and in new england um but after when uh everything came back and restarted after uh prohibition there were still a lot of porters being brewed very few again very few stouts um, but of course, nobody had drunk a porter. There were a few, uh, I think uh, Yingling produced something called Porto or something like that during during Prohibition. So, you know, they were kind of near beer style porters. Um, but basically nobody had drunk a porter for, for 13 years. So anybody uh, under uh, 30 or 31 never had this beer. Well, certainly not legally and probably, probably not at all. So you've got a whole like missing... <laughs> missing cohort of people who are not used to this tr strong black beer. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to sell them a stout, you know, a st an even stronger, even <laughs> full of more full of flavor beer uh, wasn't going to work. So you start to see quite a lot of porters in the thirties and then really diving down until probably uh, by the fifties, very few porters. And I think um, through to the seventies, there were maybe about, four mm -hmm. horses still being sting still being brewed there was uh darren gansett okay. uh was still going in rhode island uh it was uh yingling and stigmeyer and i think there might have been one other but that was it um and i don't think any stouts at all so we, we there was a difference um in the way that uh, it developed in the british isles where yes porter more or less gave way to stout uh, and in the states where where Porter just vanished and and stout never really took its place and was it was Porter you know one of the the first beers being brewed in the United States uh, uh, or, no, or something too, similar yeah um, the first Porter brewer that I've been uh, been able to find in in the states was a guy in uh, of all places Virginia um, he was a, a plantation owner, Irish plantation owner, uh, who was um, um, trying to, he was losing money on his plantation. And he decided that he would start brewing porter. Um, this was the 1760s. Uh, previous to that, there'd been quite a lot of brewers, but they'd all be brewing ales. Uh, and they'd relied for the porter on imports uh, because it was still uh, felt at that time that, you know, only london could brew porter and only thames water you know there was this myth 
of uh, the idea that only Thames water could make decent porter. <laughs> Although, uh, in fact, probably a minority of, of brewers were using Thames water to make porter. Um, so uh, for a long time, it was felt that you couldn't, you couldn't brew decent porter in, in America until this guy uh, had a go. Wasn't very successful. Um, eventually, his, his brewery collapsed. Uh, and that was at the end of the 1760s. Then along came, of course, uh, famously, uh, Robert Hare, whose father had been or was a porter brewer in London um, in a place called Limehouse, which is by the Thames. Uh, he had been exporting his beers uh, to America, sent his son out uh, with a, a, a recipe book and I think 1,500 pounds. Um, and he, I think it was thinking about settling in New York, but eventually second settled in Philadelphia, built himself a brewery there uh, and was immediate, almost immediately very successful. And of course, famously, um, George Washington was a big fan of his uh, porters. Washington had been previously importing porter from, from London. Uh, and by the 1770s, you start to get porter appearing in Bristol as well. So imports from Bristol. Uh, but of course, Washington at the earliest opportunity, uh, um, a good patriot started drinking American brewed porter, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, I want to tell you all about my good friends at Brew Chatter, brewchatter.com. They're out in uh, Sparks, Nevada, right near Reno, and uh, they've signed on as uh, uh, to help, uh, again, the uh, pay for this show so you don't have to and uh, you can check out their stuff if you want to brew a great porter i know my friends uh, rj and josh at uh, uh, brew chatter they have all the uh, ingredients they have everything you need they have all the knowledge they can help you out uh, producing a great porter so if you want to make a uh, a porter um, of whatever uh, history <laughs> Uh, types of in in history uh they could they could help you do that including uh aging it uh, with brett in uh, a wooden vessel they could do that too uh one more short break and we'll be back uh, right after this okay we're back we're talking uh porters uh with martin and uh a couple of things uh you uh, i i follow your blog i follow your uh your Twitter and all this stuff and uh, your blog, you actually, uh, it'll email out uh, all your latest postings. And they're, again, they're, they're very detailed. They're, you know, it's, it's a history lesson about, you know, something in particular. It's, it's very, it's a very nice read. Uh, where do people go to find uh, more about uh, your writings and uh, your books? Uh, well, I, 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 if I can give myself a plug, you can you can find my uh, blog at zithophile, z y t h o p h i l e uh, dot co dot uk. Uh, that's the blog. I try to put something up at least twice a month, but they tend to be. I do it entirely wrong. You're not meant to put long form essays on a blog. Mm -hmm. I can't help myself. They all end up over two thousand words. I don't know. Once I get started, it just goes on and on. And they do, I have to say, they do take a lot of research. Uh, so that's why I don't do them more often. Um, and I don't, I do it uh, in part to get the story straight in my, my own head. I, it's not so much, uh, I mean, I'm glad that people enjoy reading them, uh, but I don't really do it so much for the audience. It's for me, it's, it's all being done for me. Um, the, the, uh, the books are available on Amazon. Um, that I've, I think well, the only one is Strange Tale of the Vale, which is a collection of, of uh, past, the more interesting, I think, past blogs, like the uh, flying beer in uh, Spitfire drop tanks to the Normandy beaches and, 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 and stories like that. Um, you can only, the, the other, the book I'm most proud of so far uh, is called um, Amber Golden Black, which is the history of British beer styles. Uh, and that is now out of print, although you can still get the uh, Kindle version. Uh, so it's still available on Kindle. And I'm surprised that came out in 2010. And I'm surprised I was uh, having a look at it. It's It still stands up historically quite well, although plenty of things have changed. You know, I was just, I just fitted in a, uh, 
a history, brief history of mention of, of uh, barrel aging, which was barely a thing in 2010. And, and similarly, the IPA uh, chapter stops before the massive expansion of, of uh, different styles of, of uh, okay. IPA that we've, we've seen. Recently Someone, the, uh, uh, the sorry, uh, the, the friend of mine asked me. Uh, he said, uh, "Oh, you know, he was reading something about how um, Jim Cook uh, from Boston Beer invented uh, barrel aging beer." And I was thinking about that, and you know, like, well, beer's been barrel aged for a long time. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, it, we see with the story of Porter. Um, do you have a sense of, you know, did people back then only use new barrels lined in pitch or did they, um, uh, you know, ever reuse, you know, whiskey barrels or, uh, wine you know, something like that, wine barrels? No, I think, um, they, they tried to pretty British brewers certainly tried to get as little barrel character into their beers as possible. Um, they would buy, um, oak what they call memel oak which came from uh the baltic the um what is now i think modern uh lithuania uh which is very tight grained oak so that you would get very little oak character coming out of it um mm. this is we 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 barely you know, we're running out of time we barely even talked about it one of the reasons why uh, you got baltic porters is because the brewers were exporting their beer uh to the baltic so that they could bring back this oak from the Baltic, and mm. also the iron mm. to make the hoops with, and also <laughs> the uh, Isinglass, uh, mm. which was came from Russian sturgeon fish. Uh, so they didn't uh, pitch. I've, I've seen no references to using pitch, um, but they certainly wanted no uh, oak character at all in their beers. Um, so aging it the way that people do now in terms to actually in, in getting actual um, character from the from the barrel is a is a very new thing and it's a terrific thing you know we, um, we're seeing all sorts of uh, wonderful new styles and so on develop the only people um, who were happy to get at that sort of character out were the uh, scotch whiskey uh, distillers who who liked to buy as you probably know uh, buy old sherry barrels uh, and they were getting some of the sherry character out but um, beer brewers uh, certainly in Britain would would try to avoid anything to, to do with that but wasn't there hmm. anything that they wanted at all I you know it's just fascinating uh, you know your knowledge of uh, the history of beer and and, and porter and uh, one question I got to ask you um, what is what is one of your favorite beers uh, to enjoy now? What what styles of beers are you mainly enjoying? Or um, I, swear, I I'd like to say that if you've got a favorite style of beer, you don't really like beer. Uh, <laughs> it depends <laughs> where you are, what you're doing, and so on. Um, right now, because it's quite cold, it's suddenly got very cold and damp in Britain, and it's time again to drink dark ales. Uh, uh, and love and love. We have a lovely tradition in this country of of what we call winter warmers, mm -hmm. uh, dark, quite um, you know, quite a lot of brewing sugars in there, um, full of fruity flavours, uh, six, seven, eight percent, and they're just great for sitting around a fire and sipping, ah. sipping gently. So that's uh, at great. the moment those those are the beers that I'm I'm particularly enjoying. But I, you know, I drink. Uh, if I'm at a hot Greek beach, I'll drink a pale lager. You know, the same with everybody else. You know, yeah. Wherever you are, it's, depends it's on the situation. situation. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. There you go. Well, thank you for joining us. It's been a it's an absolute joy. Uh, next time I'm out in uh, the UK, I'm going to uh, uh, let you know, and hopefully we can get together and, uh, well, and have yeah, a pint. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. well, please do, please do. Uh, and thank you very much for letting me rab it on for an hour. <laughs> it was our pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Been, Great show. Well, awesome. Anybody else has to stop. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, and thank you to our uh, fine sponsors. Uh, check out uh, Blickman Engineering, BlickmanEngineering.com. Innovating Your Brew Day. Check out uh, Brew Chatter. Our good friends, RJ and Josh at Brew Chatter, uh, a great homebrew supply shop that can uh, help you uh, 
craft, a great porter, great, uh, great whatever beer you have. If you're listening live, stay tuned. John and I will do a, a show, a Q&A show, uh, answering your questions live on uh, whatever brew topic you might have. Thanks again, Martin. And uh, we will see you all uh, next time. Until then, everyone, brew strong. Brew strong, everyone. <laughs>